Welcome to Principles of Microbiology. This is part one of three covering chapter one, the main themes of microbiology. This chapter is going to very briefly cover a lot of the different topics that we're going to see throughout this course. So it's just kind of an overview or like it says, the main themes we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to start off with defining microbiology so you kind of understand what we're going to be looking at in this course. The micro part, micro means small, and biology is just the study of life. So from this we can get a definition. So microbiology, it's the study of organisms or life that are too small to be seen without magnification. So in order to see these microorganisms, a lot of the times we need to use different types of microscopes. The six different types of microorganisms we're going to be looking at include bacteria. A lot of this course is going to be focusing on bacteria, how they cause disease, um, what they look like, the different types. And we're going to work with bacteria quite a bit in lab as well. But we're also going to be looking at the fungi. We'll look at algae or the plant-like organisms. There's a chapter on viruses and looking at how those work, how they cause disease. We're going to look at protozoans. These are animal-like organisms. And then the last type is the helminths or the parasitic worms. Microbiology can be used in a lot of different careers, and I just have four examples up here. So we have a nurse epidemiologist. Epidemiologists are responsible for collecting data on diseases, looking for trends, and then reporting this information to the Center of Disease Control, or the CDC. Another type of career is a marine or geomicrobiologist. These individuals focus more on how microorganisms fit into the ecosystem or the biosphere of the world, and how these microorganisms are important, how they interact with each other. Another career, a vet microbiologist, these microbiologists, they take samples from animals and they try to diagnose the animal and help figure out how to treat the animal. Another example, food microbiologist. These individuals are more concerned about food safety, so they test different food items for E. coli or salmonella, so any organism that can cause um, food sickness. Microorganisms have been around for a very long time, especially the bacteria-like organisms. These ones have existed on Earth for about 3.5 billion years. These bacteria-like organisms that first appeared are prokaryotic organisms. This means that those organisms have very simple cells. From these prokaryotic organisms, we have eukaryotic organisms. These organisms, they have more complex cells. Um, in addition, they can be multicellular organisms. So we're going to be looking at the different types of cells and looking at their structure and function and what type of organisms have prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells. This slide's just going to introduce you to the different microbial structures. We have our two different cell types. If you look on the left-hand side, we have our prokaryotic cells. So remember, prokaryotic cells are these really simple cells. Specifically, prokaryotic cells, they lack a nucleus and they lack membrane-bound organelles. So in prokaryotic organisms, their DNA, it's usually found as a circular chromosome. And you can see that in the middle of the cell. In addition to that circular chromosome, you can have ribosomes. Ribosomes, they create proteins that the cell needs in order to do its metabolism or all its chemical reactions. The cell is defined by the cell membrane, so that tells you what's inside the cell versus what's outside. And a lot of times prokaryotic cells outside of their cell, they have a cell wall, and they can have a capsule like a glycocalyx or slime layer, for example. They can also have different types of appendages. Um, the cell on this slide has a flagellum as an appendage. If you compare that prokaryotic cell to the eukaryotic cell that's in the middle of this image, 
eukaryotic cells, they do have a nucleus. And that's that purple structure in the middle. So inside this nucleus, this is where you're going to find the DNA or the chromosomes for that organism. In addition to the nucleus, we have our ribosomes. We have to be able to make proteins. And then you also have different structures, and we have the mitochondria that are labeled. Other organelles include the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, chloroplast, vacuoles, vesicles, um, peroxisomes, lysosomes, and we'll get into the different organelles in the next unit. Eukaryotic cells, they also have a cell membrane, so that again tells you what's inside the cell versus what's outside the cell. And eukaryotic cells can also have appendages as well. So this cell also has a flagellum that's coming off of it. In addition to the two different cell types, we'll also be spending a whole chapter looking at viruses. So on the right hand side we have examples of viruses and we'll look at animal viruses, a little bit at plant viruses, and also bacterial viruses. Besides looking at microorganism structure and function, another theme or topic is going to be how microorganisms fit into the ecosystem. So kind of more of the ecology part of organisms, how they interact with each other. And microorganisms are really important for energy and nutrient flow throughout the Earth's ecosystems. Some microorganisms are going to be able to do photosynthesis. This is where um, we usually see it in plants, but there's cyanobacteria, so a type of bacteria that can take light energy and carbon dioxide, and they use that light energy to convert the carbon dioxide into organic material or into a sugar, so a food. Other microorganisms are decomposers, so they break down dead matter and waste into simple compounds, so they actually just recycle all these different compounds and break them down so they can be used again. You will also be learning about the human use of microorganisms. So a lot of times we think microorganisms are usually harmful, but a lot of times we can use them for good things. And this is biotechnology. So anytime we use a living organism to produce food, to produce drugs, to produce vaccines, to produce something that's helpful to humans, that's the biotechnology part. And under biotechnology, we're getting more into genetic engineering. So instead of just using living organisms, we're actually manipulating these organisms or manipulating their genes to make new products or to do new things. And one type is called bioremediation. This is where we're going to use these living organisms to solve some type of environmental problem. Environmental problems, for example, include oil spills or cleaning up waste or treating water. So anything that we're causing pollution and we kind of want to fix that problem. That's bioremediation. Like I just mentioned, most of the time we think of microorganisms as being harmful. But actually, the majority of microorganisms live in a free existence, and they're usually harmless, or a lot of times they can actually be beneficial, like we just talked about on the previous slide. Some microorganisms, they form symbiotic relationships or close associations with other organisms. And we'll look at this when we get into the ecology part and also how microorganisms interact with um, humans and animals and how they cause disease. So one type of association that you're probably all really interested in is the parasites. So parasites, they're defined as living on or in the body of another organism that other organisms call the host. And usually the parasite is going to cause some type of damage to the host. So the picture we have here, this is a tapeworm. It's found in the digestive tract of humans and animals. These tapeworms, they steal food, so they're stealing nutrients from the host. A lot of times the host will starve or they'll become really sick because this parasite is living inside of them. Another term for a parasite is called a pathogen. 
These are microorganisms, um, more specifically think of bacteria or viruses that do harm or cause some type of infectious disease. And there's nearly 2,000 different microorganisms that cause diseases in the world. And here we have a pie chart showing um, the top infectious diseases. So about 26% of infectious diseases are respiratory infections. This includes pneumonia and influenza, which are caused by bacteria or viruses. About 18% of infectious diseases is caused by the HIV virus or AIDS. The, another 18% are diarrheal diseases, so cholera, dysentery, typhoid. These again are usually bacteria, um, viruses, or some protozoans, some animal-like organisms. And then we have tuberculosis, malaria, measles, hepatitis B, tetanus, parasitic diseases, and then everything else on here. So as you can see, there's some really big categories, like the respiratory infections is the most common infectious disease that we see worldwide. So about 10 billion new infections occur every year worldwide. And out of those 10 billion infections, about 12 million of these lead to death per year worldwide. So you can see a lot of people are affected by all these different infectious diseases. This table is showing you the top 10 causes of death in the United States. The diseases in the pink or red highlighting these are infectious diseases caused by some type of microorganism. So if you look, two out of the ten top diseases are caused by microorganisms or pathogens. So number seven is that respiratory infection, so the influenza and pneumonia. And then the number ten top cause of septicemia, this is when bacteria gets into the bloodstream. And you can see respiratory disease leads to about 66,000 people dying every year in the U.S. Septicemia leads to 34,000 deaths per year. So that is a lot of people. Um, and you can see other top causes of deaths, so the heart disease, cancer, stroke, these are usually not caused by the pathogens, but they are in the top 10 causes of death. And you can compare this to this chart, which is showing the top 10 causes of death worldwide. And you can see five out of the 10, so half of the causes are from pathogens. So respiratory infection, we have the HIV AIDS, the diarrheal diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, um, and I just want to point out, so respiratory infection kills about 4 million people worldwide. So this is why understanding microbiology, understanding how microorganisms cause disease, how we treat these infections, it's really important for these people because we want to cut down on the disease and the number of deaths that we have each year. And the last thing I want to talk about in this part of part one is emerging diseases. Some diseases are emerging diseases, and this means that they show up just at one time and they infect a large number of people in a specific area. And this map is a little bit out of date. But if you look on the right hand side over in Indonesia, we have the avian influenza in 2004. And then if you go up from there in Asia, there's the SARS that we saw in 2003 up there. So this is just showing kind of recent emerging diseases, what the disease was, where it happened. And a lot of these emerging diseases are viruses or um, it looks like bacteria infections. So these emerging diseases 
These are ones that the CDC or the World Health Organization, they really track these and try to figure out why they show up and what they can do about the different emerging diseases.